So good evening. Uh, today is America's Thanksgiving. And I can't help but think in an environment uh, teeming with statisticians, with operational research professionals, and I, a humble journalist, uh, that I am the turkey who is going to be carved up. Okay. Uh, there is a community, and it's known as OR, and there is another community that's nascent, and it's known as big data. Now, you're professionals. I'm not. Well, I'm a professional in another way. I'm a messenger of big data. I'm a journalist. I'm not a statistician. So from the point of view of someone who has climbed a mountain and looked at what is happening with big data, my context for my remarks today is simply to relay what I'm seeing and see how it might contribute to your thinking of your own profession so, uh, just by noticing what's going on elsewhere in the world and how data is being applied to solve problems, big and large, in society. So instead of saying uh, this is about big data, what it is and why it matters, I've chosen in defense of big data because I want to defend it and I think we should have a healthy debate over its limitations as well as its strengths. To explain what big data is and why it matters, I'd like to start with a story. And it's a story of Microsoft Word, word processing. So the logo is an old one. That's from uh, the year 2000. And it was around the year 2000 in Redmond, uh, Washington, that many, uh, actually two in particular, but many researchers at Microsoft Research were tasked with creating a new way to detect grammatical mistakes in the software. So we know that when you type in a sentence and word, and if you misspell a word, like the word data, you put an extra R there, <clears throat> that it will, uh, it will give you a red squiggly line underneath to say, hey, the word is misspelled. But what we also know is that when you have a complete grammatical error, it will also have a squiggly line underneath. And it's green, and it says the grammar is wrong. So in here would be, the world of big data has changed since the term was coined or changed without the uh, has, um, but changing it wouldn't make sense, and so the whole sentence is green. So how would you go about, and the researchers uh, ask themselves, how should we go about improving upon the system of, of how we detect grammatical mistakes in the software program? And so they have lots of methods to do, and they realize, well, maybe we should you know, choose a different algorithm to determine how to do it. Maybe we should change the features, the parameters of what the signals are of how we would do that. And instead, they realized that Actually, you know, the training data we used to have a machine learning algorithm learn how to do this, it actually, you know, we, it hasn't been changed for years. In fact, the training data is roughly half a million words. We can find corpa of larger numbers. And so they took the, uh, the half a million words as a starting base, and they looked at different algorithms. And then they uh, added more data. They had one million, and sure enough, it improved the accuracy of the grammar checker in Word. And they got excited. So they produced more data. And they gave it. In fact, it improved even more. So now they're up to 10 million words. They went up to an order of magnitude higher. So they got 100 million words until finally they had produced 1 billion words with which to train the algorithm. And sure enough, the grammar checker improved considerably. So an interesting feature in this chart is that the checker that was the best performing checker, uh, which is called the memory-based checker, and it was looking at the first, the word prior to, word once before and word once after, the target word it was examining. Um, it improved too, but it improved the least. And in fact, it having been the best checker, now is the worst performing, and the one called Winnow, another machine learning algorithm, actually performed the best, even though it performed the least good with smaller amounts of data. So from this, if you will, this, is a, this was a clarion call, and this is almost one of the foundational papers in this nascent field of big data, which I'll explain in more detail what that means in a moment. They realized uh, in this paper, at the time, the term big data hadn't been coined, so they called it very, very large copra, of corpora of data, uh, that the lesson one was that data had become a resource. Right? They recognized that it had become a new raw material. And when we think of... Uh, data as a resource and as a new raw material of business or of society. In the past, we'd always use data to facilitate transactions. Now they were seeing data as sort of an ingredient, a little bit like the oil of the economy, of the networked economy. Now, I think these analogies or metaphors are completely tortured 
Nevertheless, there is a little bit of substance behind it. Um, the data had become an economic input. Now, traditionally, we thought of the three factors of production in economics, land, labor, and capital, and we can sympathize why the classical economists in the 1700s didn't add information to the mix. It was just so difficult to collect the data, store the data, and process the data. And it's not for lack of trying. If you read The Wealth of Nations, you get to chapter 22, and you've got page after page of wheat yield. Their, their, their theories were very fundamentally based on information and based on data. It wasn't some sort of prose-driven narrative of how humans interacted and, and exchange took place. However, they didn't see data for as a, as a sort of vital input in of itself because they couldn't use much of it, and now we can. The lesson two, the second lesson from this, was that more data led to something that was better. We were able to do something better than we could before and to do something new. So what is big data? Well, I'm happy to tell you as a professional society of people who take these uh, issues seriously that big data is complete BS and it's hype. The term itself is, shouldn't distract us. All right, if you read it in the press, it's been completely devoid of meaning and neutered. And if it means anything in this environment, it simply means we are applying classical statistical methods that are 100 years old and a smidgen of the scientific method to all areas of life that have been devoid of a quantitative bent before. But now, because these tools have been incredibly democratized, in part because they're now software-based, or because we have data that we didn't have before because of sensors and because of other small little chips that can collect the data, that we can do things that we couldn't do before. So that's really what's going on. But if you wanted to dig a bit deeper, uh, you could say this, that there are things we could do with a large body of data that we fundamentally cannot do when we're working with only smaller amounts of it. That the change in scale leads to a change in state, or if you like, um, that a quantitative shift leads to a qualitative shift. Um, it was famously summed up in a paper in Science that I'll reprise. More isn't just more. More is different. So what does more is different mean in an environment like this one? Well, we know that it, it need not look so different uh, than it did from the foundation of your own profession. Operational research was born of World War II although there was antecedents to it. Uh, and when uh, the Air Marshal Bomber Harris went to Churchill and said, you know, are we fighting the war with weapons or are we fighting with the slide, slide rule? Churchill puffed on his cigar and looked at Bomber Harris and said, that's a good idea. Let's try the slide rule. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so we have operational research. Uh, you could say that Patrick Blackett himself, for whom the lecture was named, uh, was maybe one of the first data scientists. Now, the term is evocative. Data science is the same as operational research. We had operations in the military before, but it wasn't based on research and science. We were applying the scientific method to it. We could say that if we've had a lot more data and we can do new things, that perhaps we're simply, it's one generation passing the baton to another, and all that's happening here is that there's a different rebranding exercise that needs to take place among OR professionals. I do guarantee that if you name yourselves data scientists, you will get a pay increase. But, but there's more to it than just that. Right? And the reason why it's a defense is that I know that I'm waving red meat to many of you, hence I'm the turkey, that uh, in OR, traditionally, you have very classical methods that are tried and true. Do you know how they work? I've had a lot of experience with it. Uh, you like sm not big or small data, but data that is of the appropriate size for the problem that you're trying to solve. In fact, you probably identify the problem and then look for the data to make your analyses rather than take all the data that you have like a fire hose and then just see what happens. You know, after all, we know that data mining has been besmirched because if you torture the data, they will confess to anything. We know that, uh, that you are looking for clean data. It's important because any, chain, any uh, imprecision at the level of the measurement will lead to huge problems when you extrapolate. And we know that uh, the data you're trying to understand causes. Very important. It's different. In the world of big data, it looks different. It looks like punk rock compared to the beautiful classical parameters that you're used to and measures in the classical music of OR. So let's think about it. This, these two cultures, to use C.P. Snow's uh, way of thinking about it, are two communities. 
There's the OR community where the data's circumscribed. Big data just loves more data, right? Clean versus messy, causes versus mere correlations. But it's interesting that you have these two communities that are operating in parallel. You know, we've given an award this, this, this evening to a woman who, in part of her great accomplishments, has been acting in pro bono, applying OR to the needs of, of organizations that probably can't afford to have an OR professional there. But it's interesting that big data is doing that too. There's an organization called DataKind that is actually organizing what's called hackathons in which they bring data scientists together to offer pro bono service to charities. But it's interesting that these two communities aren't talking to each other. Maybe they should. There is a, in the United States government, we see this schizophrenia. There is a chief statistician or a national statistician in the United States, uh, but the person has the status a little bit like the National Poet Laureate, which is to say it's cute, but it's a sideshow. Well, President Obama recently, about a year ago, appointed the first chief data officer of the United States government. Ironically, the person has roughly the same skills as a statistician, but with the branding difference, with a different label, hopefully the person can be more effective and can intervene into policy debates to bring statistical rigor to, uh, to decisions that are made in politics. Now, I'm mindful by saying that, that statistical rigor will be brought to bear in politics, that that sounds science fiction-y. <laughs> but most of big data is not science fiction. I'd like to talk about some examples of how it's being used for the here and now. Let's think about these three traits of big data, more, messy, and correlations. And let's start with the question of more. Now, more data is not what's essential. right? We know that, for example, uh, we have more data today than we had 10 years ago. We had more data 10 years ago than we had 100 years ago. We're always increasing in the amount of data in society. What's different is that we have more data relative to the phenomenon that we are studying and that we can even aspire to n equals all. Now, when I say n equals all, I'm not suggesting that we can ever have all the data that possibly exists. That's fanciful. But it's the idea that we can try to have all of the observations around a given problem set it's not that we're simply relying on sampling. Because when we rely on sampling, that's very useful, but it's really an artifact of an era in which we had to handle the constraints and the limitations of working with data in which collecting it, storing it, and processing it was extremely difficult. But if we remove these constraints, of course not entirely, but considerably, well now we can do new things that we couldn't, and particularly we can use all of the data. And when we use all of the data, uh, we may learn new things, but certainly we will be able to drill down to the particular and the subgroups that sampling cannot assess. Now, what does more data look like? Well, we can see that um, in the year 2000, we like to think we are participating in the information society. We were doing so in name only. Even back then, the amount of stored information that was analog was greatly larger than the amount that was digital, but by 2002, there would be roughly parity. And then after that, you can see whoosh, Analog information, which is still growing, grows linearly, while digital information grows exponentially. Um, this data is from uh, 2007, from an authoritative source, a study in science. Uh, the amount of stored information doubles roughly every two or three years. And so the purple part would be uh, twice as large, so to the floor, by 2010. The pink part on top would be half as large, We'd double again by 2013 and we'd now be through the floor and through the ceiling. Uh, and these trends look like they're going to continue. It's about a four or five order magnitude change. Now, in terms of processing power, there's a similar story. This is a logarithmic chart. I know you can't read it, but we're kind of vaguely familiar with it. It's Moore's Law. Moore's Law says the number of transistors on a silicon chip will double roughly every two years. And sure enough, that's been, that's been happening. Uh, this chart is from 1971, but we can draw roughly a, a straight line going down to 1948, the great era in which the ENIAC in the University of Pennsylvania was, one of the, was the first electronic calculator, excuse me, electronic computer, uh, and the year that uh, Lord Lockett won his Nobel Prize in physics. Uh, by the, you can see by the 80s, which is sort of the first increment on the x-axis uh, there, um, Although, again, we treat computing as some sort of uh, great phenomenon. At that year, actually by the mid of that year, um, 10 years into the Blackett Memorial Lecture by 1985, 40% uh, of the processors were accounted for by pocket calculators. 
So as to say that even by the context of, of computing from 48 to 75 to, to 85, we're still in roughly early days, right? It's only in 2002 that we actually saw that digital information had you know, exceeded the amount of stored analog information. So what does this mean? Um, the growth that we're seeing, both in processing capability and in, uh, in the amount of data, has been exponential. And honestly, we as a society are terrible at understanding exponentials. So to give you, uh, uh, in our community, that's not the case because we work with data and we think about it, but it's good to remind ourselves of what exponential growth actually means. So exponential growth, if I were to work, walk from here to the end of the hall, and I take roughly, with each stride, one meter steps. If I take 30 strides, I walk 30 meters. If the growth is exponential, that after my first, it doubles, and then it doubles again, and doubles again. If I've taken 30 strides and it's exponential growth, I have now walked to the moon and back. So uh, what that means is that the world in which we're operating and applying our statistics and applying our methods to have changed. The underlying, underlying fabric with which we're interacting with information has changed. And the big data rocket, although this is a, an analogy used by an artificial intelligence uh, expert at Stanford, it still applies to big data, which is there's two aspects to it. There's the engine and the fuel. The rocket engine is faster processors, cheaper ones, and the fuel is more data. And by doing so, we can do things that we couldn't do before. Um, hence, if we have a different environment, maybe we want to have uh, different possibilities, ask different questions, and apply different methods. I've mentioned AI once or twice so far in the talk. I'd like to talk a little bit more about it now, again, in a very general way. So one of the most promising areas of artificial intelligence is machine learning. But it's, it too is a rebranding, because when people talk about AI today in 2015, they're not talking about AI, as it was discussed in the 1950s and the 1960s. In fact, that version of AI, I would argue, failed. And it just didn't work. It was just too brittle, and it was too complex. And when we try to get rid of the view of AI from the philosophy department, and a view of AI to the math department, and even not in just the computer science department, but the math department, that suddenly these techniques started to work, um, in particular the area of machine learning. And so uh, these are chess players, and excuse me, checkers players, and to play checkers uh, requires some skill, and requires some understanding of what to do, and they're thinking very long and hard about what the next move is. And this is Arthur Samuel. And Arthur Samuel is a computer scientist who works at IBM in the 1950s, and he's the father of machine learning. He sort of invented it, and he invented it through the humble game of checkers or drafts. And so Arthur Samuel, being a computer scientist in the 1950s and likes to play drafts, does what any self-respecting computer scientist does then. He writes a program so he can play the machine in, in drafts. So he writes a program, he plays the machine, and he wins. He plays the machine. He wins plays the machine, he wins. Because Arthur Samuel only, excuse me, because the machine only knows what a legal move is. Arthur Samuel knows something else. Arthur Samuel knows strategy. So he writes a small subprogram that operates in the background, and it simply calculates the probability that after every board move, that the new board configuration will likely lead to a winning board versus a losing board. It's just statistics, big probability table, recalculated after the match. And so he plays the game again. He wins. He plays again. He still wins. And then Arthur Samuel leaves the machine to play itself. It plays itself. It collects more data. It collects more data. It increases the accuracy of its predictions. Now Arthur Samuel goes back to the machine and he plays it and he loses. And he plays it again and he loses. And Arthur Samuel has trained a machine to exceed his capabilities in a task that he has taught it. And this idea of machine learning is going everywhere. So if I were to type in the eminent name of the current president of the OR Society and I were to misspell it and put an extra N into the middle of the, the search request, how did Google know? 
that, that I had misspelled Stuart Robinson's name. Like, who at Google is employed to figure that out? Well, of course, no one is. It's a machine learning algorithm. Search goes out to the internet and it sees that instantiations of Stuart Robinson with only one N in the middle is far larger than instantiations of these two word pairs, of the of this single word pair, uh, with one N. And so it actually shows me the result that it thinks that I want. It makes a probabilistic prediction. And uh, it even, in a bout of honesty, discloses to me that, it, that what it's doing. And if I actually want to search for two ends, uh, I can click on that and do it that way. Machine learning uh, is, and those algorithms, are the reason why computer translation is not as laughable today as it used to be in the past. It is why speech recognition systems work, because we were able to digitize and datafy the, the sounds of, of words and therefore run it as data things that seem to be magical in the past. It's why we have self-driving cars, okay? How else would we be able to get a car to drive itself? Are we any better as a society at enshrining all the rules of the road into software code? No. Is it because processors are faster? No. Is it because algorithms are smarter? No. All of those features uh, are helpful, but the reason why is because we've changed the nature of the problem from one of trying to explicitly teach computer or a car how to drive with all the rules that the humans could remember and all of the exceptions that we can dredge up as well to one in which we just feed a lot of data to the vehicle and we say you figure it out. You figure out that this is a traffic light, that this traffic light is red and not green, that that means you must stop and not start. Now there's different features of machine learning and we don't just simply you know give uh, an algorithm to the data. If we have some prior knowledge, we would be fools not to actually apply that in. So there are rules involved in the self-driving car. So we can tell that exactly if it's red or green, we can instruct it on what to do. But there's lots of edge cases that the machine has to figure out itself. The idea of artificial intelligence and machine learning, statistical machine learning, is that where in the past we tried to explicitly teach the computer what to do, now we are feeding in lots of data and asking the machine to figure out itself. And when it has more data, it does a better job of that. That's the reason why, although machine learning began in the 1950s, we didn't hear much about it until right now when we started applying it, because we, although it was making small victories here and there, it's now making much more substantial victories because we have better processors and we have more data to learn from. Research recently from Stanford, again, uh, try to identify whether it could spot whether a given biopsy of breast cancer cells was highly cancerous or not. So they fed lots of uh, data into the algorithm. They did identify about 1,700 uh, different features that it wanted the machine to look for, but it didn't make any prediction whether a feature was particularly a strong signal or not to whether the, to whether the biopsy would be uh, highly cancerous or not. And in the end, the machine learning algorithm was able to identify the 12 telltale traits that best predict that a cell sample is cancerous, highly cancerous. The issue is this. The medical literature only knew of nine of them. Three of the things that the algorithm were able to spot were ones that the medical practitioners, the pathologists themselves, didn't know to look for. So if you're a pathologist, uh, you may have to reinterpret what you do to provide value, because if it's just making decisions under position, conditions of uncertainty, that's not good enough. You need to do more than just that because the algorithm will be better. And as goes the pathologist, so go the rest of us. If our job is making decisions under conditions of uncertainty, then an algorithm probably will be gunning for our jobs. It won't destroy our jobs, but it will certainly change our jobs, because we'll have to do more in terms of how we bring value to what we do. So the second feature is messiness. So in the past, we have loved clean data sets. And that was understandable, but again, I would argue, an artifact of the previous era in which we needed to have as clean data as possible for what we bothered to collect because it was so difficult to collect the data. Now, if we have clean versus messy data, we never want messy data. We would always prefer it to be highly curated and exactly precise and exactly accurate and as clean as possible. But in many instances, not all, but in many instances, we can tolerate some messiness in the data in return for what we win on the trade-off in terms of what we get by having a lot more data. 
in the same way that our Microsoft researchers probably would be willing to use data sets that had inaccuracies in it to increase the grammars because they could get a stronger signal by adding more data even if there was messy data in it as well. So let me give you the example of machine translation and how that works. So in the past, uh, machine translation was done uh, by programming a computer, and this is at Georgetown uh, in the 1940s when they were actually trying to work on machine translation for the first time. This is what one of a huge book of, uh, of flow charts that was written by a hand. Uh, very brittle, very uh, formulaic, of course. You had to try to identify one, it says, if difference is not equal to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, there is no character agreement, so test k, k uh, uh, character of dictionary word cell for existence of hyphen. Does anyone here understand that? So um, I, I wonder how many people who actually programmed that or in the community of those who programmed it could understand it. So it, it's, it's very difficult to do to have human beings uh, try to identify every case of why you'd want to translate one word for another. Um, we have dictionaries, we could upload the dictionaries and run statistics of, of word probability, but there is another way. The other way, of course, is to treat every word as a piece of data and run statistics over it, and that is to say what you care about in machine translation, statistical machine translation, is not what the word is, but what the word is relative to the other words nearby the word. And so then it just becomes a much more heavy computational problem when you add more data to the problem, you solve it. In the 1970s and 80s, the largest uh, corpus of text was known as the Brown Corpus that had highly curated, hand-checked words, and there was a million words in it. Google realized they could do better, and so instead of using one million highly curated words, they chose uh, a data set of one trillion words. They got it from the flotsam and jetsam of the World Wide Web. So it meant that it was every corporate website that had been translated into one language or the other translations, high-quality translations from all the different languages of the European Union. Uh, it meant that it was every book that they scanned that had a translation of the book that they scanned in the book scanning project they used. And of course, when they OCR'd, optical character recognition, their pages, there was, there was not always agreement, you know, um, particularly in older uh, books that had strong serifs, the S's would look like F's, right? So, so the data was not clean. In fact, it was far from clean. However, when they had more data, you have statistical machine translation that works, and works very well indeed. So this is how the world of translation works now. Uh, we simply apply computers to it, and we uh, win on the exchange. And this is one of the papers, again, another foundational paper in the world of big data, that explains what they have done. The last difference, or the last uh, interesting feature of big data is uh, correlations. Now, in society, we love causality. We love trying to understand cause and effect. And I would presume that in the OR community, uh, you yourself are highly uh, sort of levered on trying to identify cause, causal connections. Because if you can't understand the cause of problems, you can't fix those problems. And that's true, and I think we need to um, to, to maintain that, there's no reason not to. If we can identify causality, that is a great thing. Uh, the problem is that we often can't, and we're usually deluded when we think we have it. And the history of science, uh, and particularly medical science, suggests that's the case uh, with great tragedies, that many of which we know of, female hormone replacement, etc. In, in this country, cot death is another. So here's a quiz to keep you all up. Uh, I hate to disappoint you, but you have to you have to advise a presidential candidate. Uh, it's a U.S. presidential candidate, uh, but as a sign of respect to my audience tonight, I'm not going to ask you to advise the candidate Trump. I will <laughs> advise you, but you have to advise us a, a, harder, a harder person to try to win an election. Uh, the year is 2008. The Republicans have a, it's, America's at war as, as its allies. The Republicans have fielded a candidate, John McCain, who is a war hero. Another relevant factor, he's white. And your candidate is black, a junior senator from Illinois. His last name sounds like Osama, and his middle name is Hussein. You don't have a lot of chance on this. OK, but let's see what happens. How do you advise him? So the modern website is the modern campaign literature, and so what do we do? 
uh, what we want to do is in a campaign is get people to find out more information about the candidate, potentially contribute to the campaign, or volunteer. And so it says get involved and sign up. And that maybe that works. So and you just know that you know if it was you know around the table in Chicago, there was some guy you know balding gray hair beat his fist on the table and said you know you know McGovern in '68 you know Humphrey you know exciting cases relevant cases of why you have to have Obama with a lapel with the American flag right or an American flag behind him that this just wouldn't do. Right, because he's just sure of himself, he knew what it is. And typically in business, we know how decisions are made. If he's the highest paid person, they will listen to him. And if he's someone else, they will not listen to him. And so uh, you have other choices. You know, you could actually run change we can believe in. Sign up. Not so certain that's going to work. He looks a bit French. Okay? <laughs> and then you go to change we believe in, but he, there he is. He's wearing a turban, but there's no American flag, and he doesn't have, um, he's not wearing a jacket, so maybe it's too informal. Right, not serious as a candidate. So what do you do? What page is going to be better? Well, of course, no one here is going to know if I was to. I sometimes go to businesses and I might use this example and I goad them into trying to choose one or the other until I spring, I can't do it for you, you're professionals. You know that you have no idea which one is going to be better or not. No one would, not even the candidate. There's no one who's so omniscient. But we can know through the data what's going to be the most important. And uh, sure enough, when you uh, look at the data, and I don't expect you to see it, but it's to show that there is data there, that indeed the one in which was the most informal is the one that, uh, that won. That uh, its effectiveness was about 12 to uh, 8%, so a good hefty four percentage point difference, roughly, and uh, maybe three, if you will. And, um, and it raised an additional, you can simulate how much it raised, it raised an additional $60 million. That's very considerable for a test that they ran. Now, our mind races to embrace what the causal reason is. Well, you know, of course, it's because you know, a, a young you know, candidate who's unknown to the American people, we need to humanize him. Right? And what, the way to do that is with his family, but the fact, you know, a black and white photograph with the family, a portrait. Right? But the fact is, we have no idea why that was effective. But the really interesting thing is, it doesn't matter. It just didn't matter. It was a correlation. But so what? If we have this association and we can apply it, it's actually a good thing. And if we fail and it's wrong, the consequences are actually kind of minor. So you might not want to apply this if you're going to perform an operation, although you might as well if it works. right? But there's going to be lots of use cases, lots of use cases, where just relying on the correlation is good enough. It tells us what, not why, but that's fine. So you can think of it in terms of plane tickets. This one was about behavior. This is trying to understand something that's such a correlation that it's actually trying to predict another algorithm. So if we were to buy a plane ticket, how would we know uh, whether we should buy one at a price that we're seeing at an online travel agent or not? Well, what we'd want to do is collect the data, all the data around uh, all the flight price records that we have for every single route, for every single flight, for all of you know, commercial aviation for a given country. <coughs> and simply predict whether the given price x number of days prior to departure or any other signal that would be relevant is likely to go up or likely to go down. And so this company received venture capital financing and did just that. Faircast gave a forecast whether it would made sense to wait because the price was likely to go down or whether it made sense to buy right away because the price was likely to go up. Turns out the strongest signal was not the name of the air carrier or uh, actually, the number of the air carrier was a strong signal, but not the strongest. But, the, but there, there actually, I, there was no a super strong signal on which was the most important. But the features they looked at was the name of the air carrier and the number of days prior to departure. Now, the interesting thing is that in the yield management system of the airlines, they're looking at things like Saturday night stay. They're looking at uh, aspects like um, the, the load of the plane at a given moment for that particular flight would determine whether they, how they price the flight. But that didn't matter. They didn't factor that into their correlation, into their, into their algorithm. They just simply made the prediction based on a smaller amount of data, but they needed to crunch 75 billion flight price records to do it, which represented all of the, or almost every single seat on every single route of every single flight of all of American commercial aviation for an entire year. Uh, Microsoft uh, purchased it for $100 million soon thereafter because it realized it was a 
interesting company that used data uh, carefully. Now, as I mentioned, correlations, particularly in this community, are I think our first objection to where we're headed is with the possibility of spurious correlations, right? And we all know what that problem would look like. So right now there's probably uh, 2,000 people uh, in a Liverpool Street Station, and I, I ask each of them to flip a fair coin, uh, and for those who, uh, to whom it falls heads, to stay and, uh, in the station and the others can go on their way. And they do that once, you would have about 1,000. You do it a second time, you'd have 500. And after you do it maybe eight times, you have 15 people, right, who have all flipped it heads eight times in a row. And you think, hey, that's excellent, right? You know, but of course, you know, how did they do it? How, you know, do they practice at night? And of course, they don't do that, right? Of course, it's just a spurious correlation. You'd have about two or three people uh, who have done it 10 times in a row, right? And it's only with 2,000 people. So that's pretty impressive. We would find a signal that, of course, would not be a strong signal. It would be a spurious correlation. So we have some techniques in big data and machine learning to try to prevent spurious correlations. One is called dropout, in which we deliberately fuzz our data by removing a portion of the data and then running the algorithm against that. And if you do that many times, not with a slide rule, but you do it with a computer, and so you do it, say, a quarter of a million times by randomly debilitating your, your, your test data by pulling parts of you know, data from it, subtracting it, and running it again and again, you would be able to identify if there's some spurious correlations. But honestly, it's not perfect. So I think when we're in the world of big data, we are in a world of having to deal with spurious correlations at a level that we didn't deal with in the past, and that's going to certainly create lots of problems in society. I don't think there's a way around that, um, but we'll keep on trying to fight that battle, as we do today with small data. Uh, there's a more interesting uh, way of thinking about the causality versus correlation debate, uh, and it comes from a paper from just this year, and it's what was referred to by the authors as prediction policy problems. And they identify that there's, there's actually two different types of predictions that we want to make in society. It's ones that we will call uh, rain dance problems, and there's ones that we will call, excuse me, we will call umbrella problems. You can see where this is going. Okay, so a rain dance problem is if I want to know that it's going to rain is my intervention because I want to know how to cause rain. Is it a rain dance problem? Or do I want to know if it's going to rain simply because I know if I should bring my umbrella? In both instances, it is a prediction. Uh, but what our intervention is differs because if it's about a rain dance problem, I need to know causality. Right? But if my problem is whether I bring an umbrella or not, it doesn't matter if I know the cause. I just simply need to know um, if there's an association. And if I'm wrong, the consequences are low. You wait, bring your umbrella, and it didn't really matter because you never needed to open it. So what does all this mean? Where do we go from here? Well, there's actually several drivers to the big data world that I want to highlight. And uh, the first one is, is this idea of datafication. The reason that we have so much data in the world is in part because we're collecting more things on things that we've, more data on things we've always collected data on. But another reason why is because we're taking things that have always been informational, but never rendered as data, and we're putting it into a data format. We're datafying it, for, so to speak. So take the issue of location. Right, where somebody is at any moment. Right? It's, a, it's a matter of information, it's not a matter of data. And if I were to go back to, say, the 1600s, and I saw William Petty and I wanted to follow him, I'd say, you know, record his location, William Petty is at the pub. Right? And I'd look at my, my uh, sundial, and I'd say, William Petty is, you know, is, at, uh, is at the House of Parliament. Hard problem, right? not going to happen. Right? Parchment, quill. So today we know that uh, location has become a matter of data. In your pockets is a device that records where you've been probably every second of your life going back decades. That database exists. The problem is that the database exists in Langley, Virginia, but nevertheless, <laughs> the, or your cell phone carrier, but nevertheless, the, 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 the data location has become datafied. Another example is posture. The way that you're all sitting right now is different. And if I were to put a thousand sensors underneath your chair, excuse me, excuse me, 100 sensors into each one of your chairs right now, I could create an index that's fairly unique to you, a little bit like a fingerprint. So what could I do with this data? Researchers in Tokyo are using it as a potential anti-theft device in cars. 
The idea is buy. The carjacker jumps behind the wheel, tries to speed off, and the car recognizes that a non-approved driver is behind the wheel. Maybe you have to type in a password into the dashboard or the engine will stop. If you're the parent of a teenager, you can certainly think of great uses for this technology. Okay. What if every single car in Britain, or actually in Europe, every single car in Europe had this technology in it? What could we do with it then? Maybe we'd be able to identify the telltale signs that best predict that an accident is about to take place in the next five seconds. And then what we'll have datafied is driver fatigue. And the car will know that when it detects that a person slumps into this position, that it should you know, maybe take command of the vehicle. If it's a modern car, or at least honk, or vibrate the steering wheel to say, hey, wake up, pay more attention to the road. These are the sorts of things we can do when we datafy more aspects of our lives. We can store the data, share it, process it, and extract it for new forms of value. So what is the value of big data? Well, in the past, the value of information was the primary purpose for which it was collected. In the world of big data, the value shifts to all the myriad secondary purpose, purposes to which the information can be put. So let's think of grocers. Okay? Grocers. Uh, we're here at this, the Worshipful Society of Grocers, and uh, Clive Humby uh, can attest to this, that uh, we collect our sales transactions and our receipts. In this case, it's sadly not the Nectar card, but it's, uh, it's Walmart. Uh, they collect their transactions for the purpose of accounting, for bookkeeping. But when they looked at their transactions and they married the database to the weather patterns, they could identify that there was a correlation that whenever people purchased uh, uh, storm supplies prior to a storm hitting America's Northeast, not only would storms of, not only was sales of flashlights and batteries increase, but also sales of Pop-Tarts, the sugary American treat. Now, this is a correlation. It could even be spurious, but they can simply act on it by stocking the, the Pop-Tarts in front of the store uh, and during, before a storm, and of course, not only would the storm supplies increase, but so too with the Pop-Tarts. What this, where this leaves us uh, is with a few other uh, traits that we can think about when we look at the future of the world and how big data is going to change things. So the Internet of Things is uh, one of the catchwords that is popular in the, in, in the imagination of technologists, and it's coming uh, most everywhere precisely because of the economics of creating silicon chips. Uh, so it poses the question, what will happen when everything has a chip in it and everything is connected? Um, even the most quotidian things will simply apply onto Moore's law, and so we will have maybe our genome read every time we have a, a beverage. Uh, maybe it'll identify our GPS. Uh, what happens when every one is chipped? Everyone has a chip in it, and everyone is, has a connection to it. How will data be used then? Right? When healthcare meets Moore's law, we can see, we can th imagine what some of those changes would be. In the case of the pathologist, if the pathologist is an algorithm and a processor, the very nature of medical care changes, right? Instead of someone presenting themselves to a clinic when they feel the symptoms are, uh, are troublesome, maybe we will actually uh, analyze their, 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 their sample, say a stool sample through the toilet, um, at every single moment of the day, and we will learn something new about the progression of the disease, and we will identify and staunch cancers when they are the size of a speck of dust, or a, or a grain of sand and not the size of a marble when it's just too late. So these are the sorts of things that we can imagine are going to happen in the future. The point is that, it, that things will change. That uh, one of the changes will be in the area of strategy, in particular business strategy. How do we know what we know? Well, how we know what we know, of course, is you get a whole bunch of white men together and they will tell you what the answer is. Now, of course, it, the, you know, boards of directors don't look like this anymore. There's now a token woman on the board. <laughs> uh, but uh, there's another way of making decisions, and that is testing things. Every single, this is the Amazon homepage, every single pixel that you're looking at has had to slug it out and win a battle against any other option of that could be there right now, because they tested absolutely everything. That's why Amazon is arguably the largest retailer in the world, depending on how you measure it, um, after coming to nothing from nothing about 25 years ago, 20 years ago. It's a lot like the Roomba robot, in which it's sort of the glorious success of the Bayesian statistician, in which 
you don't actually know at the outset or you plan, you simply add more information to what you do and therefore uh, uh, learn trial and error of, where you, of what you want to do. You know that if we wanted to vacuum the room right now here, we could create a schema that would identify exactly where every piece of furniture is and, the, and it would be totally precise and a lot more efficient. But if we did that and we were off only by a millimeter, the robot that was going through here, the vacuum cleaner, would be banging up against the leg of a chair until the battery ran out. Instead, we just tell it to go and to course correct a little bit. And by doing so, not only does it vacuum the room, but it remembers the room as well. And so although the room can change, it'll still, if it doesn't change, it'll remember the room. It'll make a good prediction of what it is, and it'll be more impressive. It'll take longer, but it'll actually work. Okay, And it, it doesn't make any prior, it doesn't take prior knowledge, doesn't need to know how the room looked before that. All of these things point to change, change in the people and the organizations to, that work for them. Right? What you need to know changes, who you need to know changes, who your rivals are change. A lot of assumptions that we have and hold dear are transformed and they may become obsolete. For example, you know, think of a self-driving car, right? If they really exist, will we still need windshield wipers? Maybe we'll need more of them because what else are we going to do when we're in the car? But look out the window. The point is that the very basic aspects of living uh, may actually turn out differently than we expect when we add data to it in ways that we, we can't expect. In this respect, for the OR community, I bring good news. Big Data is the Full Employment Act for your professions. Right? Uh, what it takes to succeed is an intimate knowledge of, of data and techniques with which to extract the, uh, the information from it. Uh, and the humility to approach data um, in a way that um, allows us to apply it uh, thoughtfully to society's problems. And that is what you have all done for, for many decades. Uh, but there are risks to the big data era, and here's how I will end. So the first one is privacy. We know that privacy has been a problem in a small data era. It'll still be a problem in a big data era. Uh, I don't think we will ever solve the problem of privacy. Every generation will only simply manage it. Every generation will have to identify what its values are and try to calibrate the rules according to what our values are. So the, the difficult issue in privacy is that the debate has not really happened yet in terms of either A, how to protect privacy effectively, because we have rules today, but they're just not effective, and B, how we may need to change the default setting of these rules. The rules on privacy date back from the 1980s, from the OECD privacy guidelines that every country in effect has based its privacy laws on. Doesn't matter if they were an OECD or Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development member, today there's about 35 of them, um, or if the non-members, whether it's China or, um, or, Th or, uh, or Thailand, or countries in Africa, all privacy laws based on it. But the problem is that in 1980, right, you had mainframe computers and the way that data was shared uh, looked very different. It embedded, embedded a lot of the assumptions of that era. So as we try to create thoughtful and reasonable and effective privacy rules, we may actually want to recognize that there's a degree of information sharing that should be permitted and not prohibited sort of ex ante. We don't have that debate yet. The second issue is propensity. It's the idea that we're going to have algorithms that will predict what we are likely to do, and we may be held accountable to it before we've actually acted. A little bit like the case of Minority Report. So if the chief of police in London knows that a gentleman over there has a 95% likelihood of committing a crime in the next four months, what does he do? If he doesn't act, he's being anti-science, and if he does, he is denying that person's free will and moral choice. And so we're probably going to need wise decisions to probably render sacrosanct human agency and human volition so that we can't actually penalize people before they've actually acted. But the judicial system has never really dealt with that sort of idea before. It's not something of value that we needed to create because the technology wasn't possible before. The third is ownership. Who owns all this data? Is it the entity to whom it was taken or the company that actually invested in collecting it and learning from it? And here, Europe and America seem to be going in different directions with the European privacy rules in one way and the Americans with a much more uh, broad-minded, perhaps weaker approach in another. Fourthly is the issue of causality. I want to bring that up again. 
the way that, mach that machine learning algorithms work is that it is a correlation and it's not causal. In particular, there's a, a, there's a strand of machine learning that's much more uh, substantial called deep learning. And in deep learning, there's actually, we have actually no idea how it works. There's lots of different layers of what we'll call neurons that are sort of computer synapses, if you will, that take an input and give a given output to it. And these different layers are sort of hidden layers. And there's a weird adjustments that are made. But what we do is we, learn, we lose causality. So I know of one medical device company that has applied a neural network, a deep learning algorithm, to its data to identify when the device that's inside the body should activate or not. And they found out that they had their rules set approach and they had the deep learning approach. The deep learning approach was better. It's about a seven percentage point improvement in performance of how it activated itself within the body as it functioned. That sounds great. So I asked this researcher, so are you applying it? And he said, no. Actually, the general counsel told us we had to stop because the first thing that the American drug regulators and equip medical device equipment regulators want to know is how it works. And if we can't explain how it works, we can't actually apply it in practice. And so you can only imagine that although the law was never designed to increase suffering where there may not be suffering and perhaps lead to people's death, the effect of the law is to do just that. And so we need a new debate and probably new rules uh, around how we treat the issue of causality when we apply AI algorithms to uh, doing things that we need done, like medical devices. The, uh, and that's the slide for causality. Dataism is the final and maybe the most important uh, risk, and there's no good word for this, so uh, allow me to, um, to use uh, this very strange word. And it's the idea that th although we need to embrace big data and learn from it in all the ways that we can, that the data is only a simulacrum of reality. It's not the real thing in a way that a map is not territory. That the data is always fundamentally limited and that it can't, we can't apply data and big data at the expense of our values and our judgment and our sense of common sense and, our, and sense of who we are, that we're masters of this technology and not its servant. Now, I recognize that the OR community has already thought through these issues. Uh, you wouldn't be professionals um, doing what you're doing had you not. But I do want to remind you that the, that the great tradition of OR in America, as well as in Britain in particular, but in America, has some tragic consequences too. Uh, at the same time that Blackett, Lord Blackett, was helping Britain win the war by understanding how to sink U-boats, uh, there was the, a young statistician at Harvard Business School who joined the Pentagon, who was doing the exact same thing. He was a remarkable man. He eventually joined Ford, and he eventually uh, became the president of Ford before President Kennedy tapped him to become the Secretary of Defense. His name was Robert McNamara. And the data that he chose for the Vietnam War was the body count. And that was the relevant metric to assess whether America was winning or losing the war. Now, it was a heinous metric, but of course it was also an ineffective one as well. So it's a good reminder to us that we need to uh, remember that big data cannot be some sort of new alchemy that we, or a black box that we actually need to apply our sense of values to it as well. What will the future look like? I have a feeling there's going to be a rapprochement between the OR community and the big data community, even if the techniques look weird, even if there's a lot of problems. In fact, the data scientists today in Silicon Valley can benefit a lot from OR professionals who have experience and wisdom that they can pass on. I think that uh, whereas in the past it took a deliberate effort to quantify and measure, in the future everything will be quantified and measured, that the benefits outweigh the drawbacks, and I look forward to seeing what happens. Thanks a lot.